in an age of government by committee, this statesman prefers to stand alone, apart. He knows that the source of his power with the French people lies in his aloofness, his rigid dignity, his sense of grandeur. I cannot command without mystery, he says. The people have little respect for a leader they know too well. His name is Charles de Gaulle, and this is his biography. Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Charles de Gaulle. In 1927, Marshal Pétain, then France's greatest general, asked a young army captain to lecture at a French military academy. Pétain introduced the young officer with these prophetic words. Listen to Captain de Gaulle, he said. Listen to him attentively, for the day will come when a grateful France will call upon this man. Charles de Gaulle, President of the Fifth French Republic. His people are fond of saying, when de Gaulle looks at a map of France, he is looking in a mirror. And de Gaulle himself declares, even as an adolescent, I felt the whole interest of my life consisted in rendering service to France. Nineteen seven. 17-year-old Charles de Gaulle holds himself apart from his schoolmates. He is engrossed in French military history, and he dreams of a career in the army. Two years later, de Gaulle is admitted to Saint-Cyr, the West Point of France. Here he thrives on the elaborate ceremony, the ritual and stern discipline. He is a commissioned lieutenant when World War I explodes across Europe. Seeing action for the first time, de Gaulle is horrified by the carnage. But he becomes a superb officer, and he admits that he's fascinated by the drama of war. He has earned an impressive array of decorations by the end of the war. Life in post-war France is not what de Gaulle had expected. Paris in the 1920s is a city of easy pleasure, gay irresponsibility. De Gaulle, a Puritan at heart, watches with stern disapproval. During these years, de Gaulle devotes himself to the study of military strategy. He idolizes Marshal Pétain, France's great war hero. Pétain earned his fame as a genius who revolutionized military tactics in the First World War. Now, with Pétain's encouragement, de Gaulle developed some new strategic ideas of his own. French generals ignore de Gaulle. But Adolf Hitler makes de Gaulle's writings required reading for his general staff. The army of the future, de Gaulle predicts in 1934, will be completely mechanized. It will include heavy, medium, and light tanks. Troops will be transported in armored vehicles. Speed and mobility will become the key to modern war. Based on de Gaulle's theories, German militarists developed the lethal panzer divisions of the Third Reich. On September 1st, 1939, the Panzer Divisions thunder into Poland. World War II 
War II has begun. For the second time in 25 years, France mobilizes for war. But a holiday mood prevails in Paris. The French general staff claims that Hitler's army will destroy itself, trying to break the heavily fortified Maginot Line. Colonel Charles de Gaulle desperately argues that the Maginot Line is useless without mobile armored divisions to back it up. Most top level officials meet de Gaulle's arguments by calling him an alarmist, a defeatist. May 1940, German armor smashes through Belgium and attacks the Maginot Line from the rear. The French have no armor to meet the German thrust. Within days, the Maginot Line collapses. De Gaulle has seen his warnings borne out by one of the greatest routes in history. In two weeks, the French army has been dealt a crushing defeat. Now, de Gaulle is hastily promoted to general and asked to advise the demoralized French high command. But the call comes too late. June 14, 1940, the Nazis enter Paris. One Frenchman writes, Today we have seen the ultimate dishonor. Broken, Charles de Gaulle flees to England. The day after he arrives, de Gaulle speaks to the French people by radio. Nothing is lost for France, de Gaulle says. We have lost a battle, but we have not lost the war. I, General de Gaulle, call you to rally to me. The flame of resistance must never be extinguished. Small groups of Frenchmen gather around de Gaulle, and he names this handful of followers the Free French Army. De Gaulle's army of exiles give him fierce devotion. Only a few months earlier, they were demoralized and shamed by the fall of France. Now responding to their new leader, they become proud again and eager to defend their nation's honor. In France, however, an old and tired Marshal Pétain meekly submits to the Nazis. He heads a puppet French government which collaborates with the invaders. Marshal Pétain brands de Gaulle a traitor and orders his execution. Charles de Gaulle has become a man without a country. But now he issues a defiant answer. He declares that Pétain and all the members of his puppet government are guilty of treason. I alone, says de Gaulle, represent the loyal leadership of France. England's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, often clashes with de Gaulle over the status of the Free French Army. De Gaulle says with a smile, when I am right, I get angry. Churchill gets angry when he is wrong. So we were very often angry at each other. Despite their quarrels, Churchill has an abiding respect for de Gaulle. President Franklin Roosevelt, however, refuses to recognize the free French leader. 
Roosevelt considers the ambitious de Gaulle an opportunist, plotting to become post-war dictator of France. At the Casablanca conference, Roosevelt introduces the man he would like to see leading free French forces. Another refugee French army officer, General Henri Giraud. This move enrages de Gaulle, and he indignantly refuses even to attend the conference as long as Giraud is present. Finally, Churchill wires de Gaulle an ultimatum. If I have to choose between Roosevelt's friendship and yours, I will choose Roosevelt's. De Gaulle swallows his pride. The four actors put on their smiles, de Gaulle recalls bitterly. The gestures agreed upon were made. Although he will work with Giraud, de Gaulle will not give up his claim to the leadership of the French people. Spring, 1944. De Gaulle broadcasts a call for French resistance, an appeal to patriotism. Fight with all the means in your power, he tells France. The night is now over. In occupied France, the Nazis punish sporadic acts of resistance with wholesale reprisals. Throughout most of France, however, the French people seem content to accept the Nazi occupation. The promised Allied invasion of France is imminent, but the Allied High Command cannot predict whether the French people will support the invasion. De Gaulle insists that they will. As D-Day begins, Charles de Gaulle looks to an uncertain future. For four years, he has been a lonely exile in a foreign country. Without authority, he has claimed the leadership of France. Now the French themselves will decide whether de Gaulle has been making history or merely watching it. June 1944, after four anxious years in exile, Charles de Gaulle returns to France. The farmers and tradesmen of Normandy erase allied doubts of de Gaulle's popularity, his right to lead. German army begins to evacuate Paris as Allied forces advance to within a few miles of the city. All of Paris is poised, a resistance leader writes. The city is like a cat ready to leap at the Bosch. has said it is absolutely natural and right that Germans should be killed by Frenchmen. If the Germans did not wish to receive death at our hands, they had only to stay at home. August 26, 1944. Parisians flood into the streets to celebrate their liberation and to welcome Charles de Gaulle. 
despite German snipers hidden along the rooftops, de Gaulle walks unprotected into the heart of the city. refuses to seek cover. To him, not even his life means as much as showing his countrymen the brave dignity, the confidence of a victorious soldier. In that moment, he says, I simply trusted in the fortune of France. Paris is free. As the war ends, French courts begin the grim task of trying collaborators. The chief defendant is Marshal Pétain, once a national hero and de Gaulle's idol. In a Paris courtroom, Pétain is pounded with charges of treason. De Gaulle cannot bear to witness Pétain's disgrace. But he writes his old general an anguished letter. You who have always done such great honor, he says, you who were once my leader and my example, how could you come to this? On Pétain's behalf, de Gaulle pleads for leniency. Surely somewhere in France, he asks the court, you can find a place for this old soldier, a place where he can see a little grass. Soon after VE Day, de Gaulle makes a triumphant visit to the United States. And he receives a hero's welcome. Under de Gaulle's banner, the world expects a resurgence of French strength and prosperity. Within months, however, it is apparent that French politics have fallen into an old, familiar pattern. Factional battles in the French Assembly produce a legislative stalemate. De Gaulle, the chief executive, is powerless to break the deadlock. January 20th, 1946. De Gaulle stuns France by announcing his resignation. He hopes that the shock of his decision will prompt a quick and forceful demand for his return. The call De Gaulle hopes for does not come. In 12 years, 23 different men try to form lasting coalition governments, and eventually all of them fail. Government becomes a comic game of musical chairs. Without consistent, forceful leadership, France flounders. Bitter strikes and riots plague their nation. De Gaulle's worst fears for France are realized. In 1955, Algeria, France's proudest and richest colonial possession, is torn by a civil war. The Muslims rebel after more than a century of French domination. In the back country, terrorists wage a fierce guerrilla war. The French army grows desperate, bewildered by its failure to crush the rebellion. Army countermeasures degenerate into savagery.
In May 1958, Algeria collapses into anarchy. In the chaos, a new insistent cry is heard. De Gaulle a pouvoir. De Gaulle, we need you. One politician admits, yesterday we were standing. Today, we are on our knees. Tomorrow, we shall be on our bellies begging De Gaulle to take over. Finally, de Gaulle states his position. I am again ready to assume the powers of the Republic, he says. But de Gaulle makes it clear that he will seek sweeping new powers for his government. May 18, 1958, de Gaulle leaves his country home and drives to Paris. He has waited for the peak of crisis. Now, with France on the verge of civil war, he can grasp the authority he was denied in 1946. This is my way, de Gaulle says. I have never been given power. I have always taken it. On June 1st, he is named as premier of the Fourth Republic of France. In less than four months, de Gaulle offers a new French constitution, and it is approved by referendum. The Fifth French Republic is born. Under it, de Gaulle is given more power than any French leader since Napoleon III. Almost immediately, the French economy begins to boom in response to de Gaulle's effective leadership. A new wave of prosperity sweeps the nation. In 1959, de Gaulle turns to the festering Algerian situation. He surprises the world by offering the Algerians their eventual freedom. The French in Algeria feel that de Gaulle has betrayed them by endorsing independence for the Algerians. Bitter army officers spur a new rebellion. De Gaulle breaks the insurrection with a single dramatic speech. He dons his old army uniform to tell the rebels, it is I who bears the destiny of France, and I must be obeyed. Goal finally forces acceptance of Algerian freedom. The former colony achieves its independence. De Gaulle brings a shaky peace to Algeria for the first time in more than 10 years. Charles de Gaulle alone is credited with most of the achievements of the Fifth Republic. De Gaulle regards this as right and fitting. To him, the Fifth Republic is a personal creation, his final and greatest service to France. But what will happen when de Gaulle's towering figure is gone, when this unique man no longer guides his nation? Says Charles de Gaulle with a touch of cryptic irony, there will be no great problem when I am gone. It is simple. You have only to find another de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle assumed the leadership of his nation twice in times of crisis. Though the French Empire crumbled around him, though his nation was beset from within and without, he solemnly pledged to restore the past grandeur of France. I see myself as a navigator enveloped in a heavy storm, he said. But if I keep my course, I am certain the horizon will clear. Charles de Gaulle, a proud man, certain that he could shape the course of history. Mike Wallace for Biography.